thank you for having me at Data Team Summit. I'm super excited to share with you everything that I've learned in my career about building innovation culture within my teams. I'm Julia Bartmesser. I've spent over 20 years building data technology capabilities and building data and technology teams. I have now my own consulting company, Data for Real, and I concentrate on helping CDOs make data organizational priority and deliver value faster. So today we're gonna talk about how to create the spirit of innovation within the teams that we build. And you know, there are a lot of books around this, and we have heard things like fail fast forever and ever. And I'm sure there is a section in a bookstore, Virtual Real, where there are tons of books that talk about how failure is important for innovation and the culture that accepts failure is also important for innovation. If I were to define what innovation is, I'm going to start with the definition as a data person. It's innov being innovative means you are trying new things or you're trying to do things in a new way. And by definition, if you're trying to do something new, you're doing something you haven't done before. You know, I'm saying something that's pretty obvious, right? You've never done it. It may work. It may not work. If you're not comfortable failing, and if the company is not comfortable with people failing, you're not going to get a lot of innovation. Yet, we struggle. I know I struggle. I know I struggle to talk about things that I have done that didn't work. Companies as a whole struggle with building innovative cultures. And you have all kinds of, org of organizational arrangements that I have seen in my career from having a specific groups or divisions that are focused on innovation. And of course, if you're not in that division, aren't you supposed to do innovate? To having chief innovation officers, to saying innovation is everybody's business and we're going to have a mailbox where you can send you innovative ideas and somebody somewhere may be acting on them. And to be perfectly honest, I have struggled in my life as well. And I've been thinking about it for a while now, especially as I've started managing larger and larger teams, how do I bring that spirit to the teams, especially data teams, especially in the last 10 to 15 years where expectations are that data analytics, AI, LLMs now, will significantly differentiate the businesses. And to differentiate, you need to do things differently. Again, I'm going back to the definitions. So data teams do have a burden of being and performing not only reliably well, but also creating innovation within the company. So again, as a data person, I'm gonna start a little bit with the root cause analysis. So the first, think about when we bring up children. So that, again, another section in the bookstore, all the books around how do you bring up children? How do you keep them safe? How do you make them good citizens, good people? A lot of it is around consequences. So the natural consequences of a type where your toddler touches a stove, it's hot, gets hurt, doesn't touch again. So that's a retreat, right? There was a consequence, uh, the child retreated. Or you create your own consequences as a parent. I mean, I've spent the first 12 years of my daughter's life continuously thinking about consequences. I got so tired that by the time she got to 13, my consequence was, if you do this, I'm going to come up with something. I don't know what yet, but trust me, it's going to be unpleasant. And by that time, she believed me and she trusted me and that was enough and I didn't have to actually come up with the consequence. But that's what we teach, right? So we try to incent the behavior and we create consequences. And that more or less works well. Of course, some teenagers get, as opposed to retreat uh, reaction, they get the revolution reaction and they go off and they try all the things that you've been trying to teach them not to do. And that's also not a good reaction. It's actually not a good reaction in the company as well when you're producing, but we'll talk about it a little bit later. But we move this concept of consequences and created clear expectations in the way we manage team and we manage uh, performance within the company. So think about it. How do we manage performance? We have usually majority of the companies I work for half an annual performance management process. So to be fair, you start beginning of the year, with whenever your year in the company begins. I've had it anywhere from December to July. You come up with the yearly goals, there is the whole yet another 
Porsche of a bookstore. How do you set up goals? There is a whole notion of SMART goals. And in SMART, S and M stands for specific and measurable. Usually, in my experience, those goals say something like that you've got to deliver your milestones, your deliverables on the budget, within the time frame, and with agreed upon scope. And you get judged on that, right? So by the end of the year, if you've done that, you get promoted or you get more money or you get a bonus. And if you keep missing the deadline or keep overspending your budget, that's not good. And you may not, you will not get promoted and you will most likely not get as much of a bonus. And if you really keep doing this, you may even get performance improvement plan and get laid off or fired or something. So again, what do we reinforce? When we say that you need to deliver on the budget and within a agreed upon timeline, what is budget and timeline? It's estimates. So what you do has to comply with the estimates you gave before you did it. What does that mean? So the safest way for you to hit timeline and the budget is to do things exactly the same way you've done before. Then you know for sure how much time it's going to take you. So what are we doing by those goals that are specific and measurable and clearly relevant and pos and possible to implement is that we incent lack of innovation. We tell people to keep doing things the same way they've been doing it forever so they can meet the timeline and the budget expectation, which is opposite to what you want. You want innovative culture, right? But that's how we build. This is the goals and the performance management and the culture Without even thinking about it, we're building the culture of accountability, but you need to think about how, in addition to accountability, you build a culture of innovation, which seems to be contrary to accountability. So what do we do? The first piece is, as a manager or leader of the team, is to become comfortable talking about things that didn't work. Do root cause analysis. But do it as not, okay, we've, we've delivered this and five things didn't work and this is the people who failed us and, and then you do root cause analysis. That creates a lot of negativity. So first, be comfortable talking about failure. One of the things, for example, I did when I was hiring people, and I think it surprised a lot of people I have interviewed when I was hiring data architects, one of my questions was, tell me about data warehousing implementation that failed. What was your experience? What did you learn? A lot of people, especially architects, did not want to talk about it. They kept talking about all the ways they've succeeded. I've been in this business long enough. I know at implementation that failed. Certainly I did. So I want to know what they've learned. I didn't, do they know how to do it better, but they tried. So create acceptance, but that's not enough. Because if your metrics are still deliver on time, on the budget, you can talk all you want. But in practice, you're evaluating people and your evaluation driving the behavior of being as predictable as possible, which means not doing a lot of new things. So the second piece is measure, have different metrics. So the name of my talk is that failed MVPs is your second most important metric. What's the first one? So the first one is number of things that you have tried, it's number of new approaches, and they don't have to be huge new things. It doesn't have to be, okay, I abandoned using this language and now I'm using the other language. Or in the middle of the project, I totally changed the platform. Or in the middle of the project, I totally changed the architecture. Revolutionary approach to company where have, you have to deliver doesn't really work that, that well and also doesn't create actually the culture of innovation that you're looking for. What you're trying to build is a culture of evolutionary even innovation. You want to keep doing things better and keep trying new things. So the first one is number of new things you've done. Why is it important to also count number of things that didn't work? Because again, you want it to be explicit that your expectation as a leader is that some of those things will not work. So if you measure how many, if you talk about, okay, you have tried 10 new things, of them five didn't work, 
And that's fine. And let's discuss why didn't they work? What parts didn't work? What did we learn for the next time? Then it's a normal. You normalize this conversation. However, if you only uh, count how many new things you've done and you never have a like conversation about failure, again, we don't like failure. We just don't. We don't like talking about it. So you want to push people outside of their comfort zone to normalize that conversation. So those are very two very important metrics. And of course, the third one is number of successes because you do need to deliver value for the company. But the amount of value you deliver is directly proportional to innovation within your team. And that's directly proportional to a number of things you've tried and failed at. And that's the understanding you want to build both within your team and communicate it outside of your team as well. So people expect that. And that's not the only one, though. Here is another piece that people don't think about very often. So in addition to thinking about and metrics of how many new things you've tried and how many times your MVPs failed, you need to give people slack. What do I mean by slack? You need to give people time to think about new ways of doing things and to try them. And again, if you do something new, it takes you longer. So you need to give people that space. So you still need to have the timelines, but your timelines need to give people slack. You can't uh, assume or you cannot plug into your calculations how long a certain project will take that everybody works 40. And sometimes we, frankly, let's be frank, when we have really important deliveries, we don't plug in 40 hours of work, we plug in 60 hours of work. And we have teams, and especially data teams, in my experience, feel so strongly about their mission that they work 60 to 80 hours. And you and I call those projects death marches. So not only you shouldn't do 60 or 80, you really shouldn't even do 40. And you should think about how do you build Slack? Why is Slack important? So let me date myself a little bit and tell you a story of my own experience. Um, as a developer, way back when, I was a very junior developer. My first job was at Bloomberg. And way back when, Bloomberg was just a terminal. You didn't have it connected to your PC. So you had a separate terminal. You had a separate square keyboard. So people who have seen it, who maybe now they're dating themselves, I remember that keyboard. It was good looking, but not very practical. So, and as a new developer, and again, I'm going to date myself even more. I'm not going to talk about APIs or... R or any of those languages, I'm going to talk about Fortran because that's my first job was developing in Fortran. So as a new developer, of course, I was taking over a more senior developer code. And that was a more senior developer, but his way of writing code was doing a lot of cut and paste. So again, this is Bloomberg Financial Services. I was in the mortgage team calculating prepayments. So if you think about mortgages as a mortgage holder, payments are really important for investors in mortgage securities. So you do a lot of prepayment calculation, just a lot, historical and forward. So one of the functions I took over was, one of the screens I took over, was a lot of calculations around prepayment and the way the developer, most senior developer has done it, there was a lot of cut and paste. So every time he needed to calculate prepayment on some page, on some place on the screen, he cut and paste the code. I have never been able I was very junior, but still, there is no wonder I ended up in reusability, in re building reusable data and technology platforms and running enterprise architecture teams because I can't really do cut and paste. I can't do the same thing in multiple places and do not think of how to streamline. So reusability has always, always been very important to me. So, but if you do cut and paste, there is already the code. I need to edit one more place. You know, in a Bloomberg development cycle would have taken me maybe a couple of hours, then a couple of hours to test, a couple of hours to put, push out to integration environment, and then I'm done. And that's what my boss was expecting. So he was expecting that I'll take it over. I'm new. I'll be a little slow. So instead of three hours it would take for a senior guy, it would take me six hours. Except that I looked at that code and I decided that I can't really stand supporting code like that and I'm going to write a function. So I took more time. Because A, I had to write it. B, I had to plug it in on all the places. Now I had to test a lot longer. Now the testing team had to spend up more time testing this code. So instead of taking a day, day and a half, it ended up taking most of the week. I can tell you my boss was not happy with me. I was happy with myself 
I was also really happy with myself. Next time I had to add prepayment calculation to that function. And by that time he was happy with that as well. But you know, as a lot of you know, when your boss is not happy with you the first time, that sticks. Then him becoming happy later doesn't really help all that much. So I didn't do myself any favors, except that you kind of have to stay true to yourself. So the point in this really long and drawn out story, the point that I'm trying to make is uh, that you have to give people time. What I've done was great for the company, for this code. This function was then used in multiple other screens. So it was actually in a great innovation for this group, for this company. Obviously, you're listening to me, and this is what you learn in computer science courses, that you need to encapsulate your repeated functionality. But for this company at that time, for that group, that was actually innovative, and it helped a great deal to deliver more and faster down the road. I took up time. I didn't have Slack. I created Slack for myself, or I was too junior of a developer to not be afraid of the consequences back then. But again, that breeds out, right? So if you keep being evaluated on time and on the budget and you take a slightly longer approach the first time and you keep doing it, that's your consequences are going to teach you to retreat or leave the company. So you don't want your best people to either retreat or leave the company. So let me talk again what are the things I have learned and what do I do in my own teams? The first piece, create Slack. Be very mindful about creating Slack. I cannot tell you how difficult I find it and the leaders in my team found it as well because you have a lot of pressure. You have a lot of expectations from your business people. You have a lot of expectations around on-time on the budget delivery. So creating that Slack so people have time to experiment and also have room in their head to experiment. That's also very important because if you are running all the time, you concentrate on running. You don't concentrate on how to run better. So you need to create that room for people to think about what to do better. So that's incredibly important. Creating Slack within your project and program and initiative teams is incredibly important. The second one, Adjust what you measure. So metric number one is number of new approaches or new things you have tried. Metric number two, how many of those have failed? Metric number three, how many of those have succeeded? And actually, there is a whole new discussion around how to measure business value and number of successful deliverables. It's internal project management metric. You do need to measure business value more holistically than just on-time delivery and actually number of new things you've tried plays into overall business value a lot more. Thank you. I hope this has been useful for you. And let me know if you have any questions.